Hey there guys, I'm DJ Slope and welcome to the complete history of Contra. This particular video took months to research, uh, to try out, to script, to edit. It took an incredibly long time and I just want to say a massive thank you to all of the YouTube members and Patreons that help make videos like this. If you want to help support the show and you like this particular video, then please do consider becoming a Patreon or YouTube member yourself. The links will be in the description. Anyway, let's continue on with the video. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's do this. One of the most important game franchises of a generation, and a series that quite literally is talked about more than any other here on the tubes. Does it deserve it, or is it just internet hype? Well, let's find out with a series that honestly just doesn't know when to stop. Contra. Or Probotector or Grisor. <laughs> yes, this was a hard history piece to make. Yep, today, ladies and gentlemen, I plan to take you all on a journey. A journey that starts in the arcades, creates massive ripples during the 8 bits, gets confused of itself when it reaches the home computer market and Europe in general, finds its footing once again during the 16 bit era before yet again bringing it back, possibly better than ever. And just when you think you can't possibly do anything else with it, they give us pandas. <laughs> confused? Well, you're lucky, because I was disappointed. But enough about pandas. In fact, I think we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. So, let's go back to the beginning and look at the complete history of Contra, where we will not only look at the ups and downs for the series, but find out where it all began, what inspired it, who made it, why was the name changed several times, why was there such massive gaps in its development, why games got cancelled, why games got changed completely, and of course, we're going to look at every single game in the series too. Strap in guys, because this is a long one. Welcome to Slope's Game Room. Back in the early 80s, 1981 to be exact, a young Koji Hiroshita, an eager and intelligent computer user from Osaka, Japan, joined the video game company Konami and got to work straight away on Amida, a sort of maze type puzzle game that involves you controlling a gorilla, running along several lined grid type patterns in order to get all of the boxes on the grid filled in whilst dodging the enemies. Honestly, it was fine, and this kind of game was a very typical Konami type game for the time, coming out shortly after such titles as Astro Invader or even Space King. Yes, they're both Space Invader ripoffs. You see, Konami was in the midst of chucking out quick pick up and play experiences, desperately trying to find the new Space Invader sensation, and most of the time they missed. But when they hit, boy, did they hit. The games didn't take too long to code for the most part and that's why there was just so many of them. And Hiroshida san was one of the guys that was churning out these titles. And although that may sound bad today, it was actually pretty good. Because sure, even though Space Invaders for instance was still the best of the bunch, when new game developers take inspiration for whatever's hot at the time, the results can actually be for the best as you will soon see. As more and more of these games came out, we started to see some really quite impressive arcade titles that to this day have earned themselves a rather legendary status, including my personal favourite of the underdogs if you will, Mikey. But back in 1985, a new style had really blown up with Konami's Russian Attack, aka Green Beret. And of course, you've got Capcom that released Commando, both releasing fairly close together that same year. Sure, we still went to space to fight off evil invaders, but the real battle was now happening on the ground. And a couple of years later, we got the brilliant, although rather underrated, 
boot camp or combat school as it was known in Japan from Konami and of course before that even SNK pumped out the amazing Akari Warriors too. You see the trend here? Yep, this new style of game had blown up quite nicely and Hiroshida-san and his team decided to do it themselves. But this time they decided to add one of those big fat army jeep things, aka a jackal. Now to be fair, this style of game can actually go back further than Commando, even though many believe that this is the first of its kind, as even Hiroshida-san had experimented with the genre two years prior with Megazone. But seriously, if we end up talking about what referenced what, we'll actually be here all day. So, like I said, let's look at Jackal. Although not as well known as others in the genre, it definitely did well for the company and was the first true step towards Hiroshida-san's true magnum opus, which would actually only come one year later. You see, Hiroshida-san was a big fan of not only these new military-styled games, but also military-styled movies too. Well, Hollywood's glorified versions of these movies at least, as they've been pumping out plenty of movies of this style with the manliest men they could find, and in 1985 alone, Stallone was in Rambo First Blood Part 2, Norris was in Missing in Action 2, and of course you got Schwarzenegger, who was in Commando. Although it was actually a different commando than what we've already mentioned in this video, they just released the same year, and uh, <laughs> I'm pretty sure that Capcom was pretty happy about that. Anyway, Hiroshida-san loved a good old one man versus an entire army flick and or game, and taking inspiration from all of the previously mentioned titles, he got to work on his next game, which of course is the first game in our rather lengthy list of games that we're going to be talking about today. I am of course talking about Contra. Three-way scroll. High position visual. Sound selective mode. It's a super AV action. Contra. ファミコン用カセットコントラ好評発売中。Konami February the 20th, 1987 was the day that this legendary futuristic run and gun game was released where you, according to Japan, play as Bill Riser and Lance Bean of the Earth Marine Corps Contra unit in the year 2633 AD. You're sent to a fictional island to destroy the evil Red Falcon organization who wants to wipe out humanity which is obviously all in a day's work for our heroes, right? Well. It was far from easy. You control your characters on a typical side-scrolling level layout similar to Green Beret which we mentioned earlier, but the way your character controls and the way your shots are fired, especially the later upgraded ones, were obviously highly inspired by all of those top-down run and gun games that we mentioned earlier. What Hiroshida-san had managed to do was actually quite brilliant. He took a style of game that was already popular and pushed together several elements that would make one rather unique game, and by including alien references too, it was a surefire way to get a successful title. Let's not forget guys that this was released only one year after James Cameron's excellent alien movie follow up, and one year before Arnie's groundbreaking Predator movie. But on top of this, as you play through the game you actually get an over the shoulder style perspective that although rather primitive looking now was indeed quite the treat as you make the way to the boss that was also a breathtaking spectacle to attempt to defeat. Contra was and still is a stupidly hard money grabber. You're going to die a lot and you're going to be putting in enough fake credits to pay for that month's rent. But somehow, it's kind of fair. Let's face it, you're just one or sometimes two guys against an entire evil organization. It's going to be hard. But thankfully, when you kick the bucket for the most part, it's your fault. 
Sure, from time to time, the deaths can be a little bit cheap, resulting in you having to memorize a lot of the enemy placements. But as you play and as you get better, you'll feel more badass and you really do get sucked into this rather stunning game for the time. It's no mystery as to why this game did so well, but as you are probably all aware, it was actually when the game got ported away from the arcades and into the homes that it really did build itself up to its long lasting legacy. Yes, I know all you guys want me to jump straight into the classic NES ports, but did you know it was actually the home computer ports that got it first, with the release of Grizor. My fellow Americans, I've said on several occasions that I wouldn't comment about the recent congressional hearings on the Iran-Contra matter until the hearings were over. Well, that time has come, so tonight I want to talk about some of the lessons we've learned. But rest assured, that's not my sole subject this evening. I also want to talk about the future and getting on with things because people's business is waiting. So, what's up with the name change? Well, that would be because of the Iran-Contra affair. For those that don't know, this was a huge American political scandal under President Ronald Reagan's leadership where senior administrators were secretly selling weapons to the Khomeini government of Iran in the hopes to fund the Contras in Nicaragua, who were a right-wing group of individuals known for their numerous reports of human rights violations and terrorist ways. The funding and support of these groups were banned by US Congress, but as stated, the funding just didn't stop. And that was the Iran-Contra affair in a nutshell. It was widespread news for the time and obviously the release of a game called Contra wasn't exactly going to be going down too well when leaving Japan. So they decided to change it to Grizor, which a lot of us home computer folks in the UK would instantly become familiar with at the time. The late Bob Wakelin was the guy behind the original box art of Grizo, and I know it's been beaten to death by this point, but yes, when looking at the front cover, that's a copy of Arnold Schwarzenegger, and that again is Arnold Schwarzenegger. If we do jump ahead slightly on the later box art, you'll even see a Xenomorph from the Alien franchise too. <laughs> now, to be fair, Bob was an exceptional artist, creating such legendary covers as Athena and Batman, and a lot of the time these artists did didn't have a lot to go on. This was one of those times. A predator slash alien ripoff is what the game appeared to be. So I supplied a predator slash alien style pick with ripped Arnie predator poses. The white areas were left for screenshots to be dropped in. A thoroughly boring job to do, although a couple of my survivalist bodybuilding Nam obsessed mates thought it was cool. So let's take a look at these ports. Published by Ocean, but not always made by them. Firstly, you've got your Commodore 64 port, which feels even harder, sadly not due to the awesome gameplay, but instead it's endless amounts of weird bugs. It's missing a nice chunk of the game too, and the speed is strangely faster here, making this less about precision and more about keeping hold of your own sanity. The ZX Spectrum port is one of the worst, mainly due to it not giving you the ability to walk backwards for some reason, and obviously because it's on the Spectrum and games like Contra with bullets flying all over the place, it's incredibly easy to not even notice the projectiles coming your way, as they can easily blend into the background. Here's your DOS port that seriously sucks. It constantly runs forwards, meaning that you have to actually literally run backwards in order to try and stop. I found this one virtually unplayable for the short time that I tried it. The Amstrad CPC is one of the best, looking rather great in itself. Its only real flaws are the fact that the screens jump from screen to screen, resulting in a lot of trial and error needed for enemies that fire as soon as you appear on the next screen. Also, it is worth playing this version if only for the ending that surprisingly is different in this version where our heroes accidentally blow up the earth. The MSX port is surprisingly one of the best too, as this one was put out by Konami themselves, and although it too does the whole screen by screen gameplay style, and only has a one player ability, it has double the amount of levels than even the arcade, and on top of this, they have been kind enough to give you a life bar too. <laughs> nice! 
And before we get to the super popular versions, I might as well take this opportunity to show off a few oddities. Obviously the original got ported countless times on the PlayStation 2, Xbox Live Arcade, the DS. The most recent port is on the Switch, which is honestly the best way to play it. You've got little handheld devices, countless ports on mobile phones throughout the years. And in 2011, a remake of the NES port, to be fair, was put out called Contra Evolution, which although did get a couple of mobile ports, actually started its life as a separate arcade game. The graphics I didn't like, and honestly I didn't even try the mobile ports with all of their touch button nonsense. However, the arcade port, although not as good, was at least, in my opinion, still perfectly fine. You got a few extra people to play as in this one and an extra special weapon and after playing so many versions of the game for this video, it's fair to say that they tried to capture the original feel but ultimately made their own game. I'm not sure it's good enough to warrant a second playthrough but there's no denying that I did have plenty of fun emulating this arcade port. Now, I'm sure there are a few I have missed like the later release Contra LCD game but you get the idea never played Contra, you've got no excuse. This bad boy was so popular that it got re-released more times than an Eagle's Greatest Hits. And uh, well, maybe that's why it sold so well, yeah? Regardless, none of these ports and re-releases had anything on the glorious NES ports. But what made the NES and Famicom ports just so good? Well, let's look at the first game right now. Contra is simply a must-own game for the Nintendo Entertainment System. Personally, I wouldn't put it in my top NES games library, however its significance can go right alongside games like the Turtles for me. Konami had a hit on their hands with this title in the arcades and instead of just making a simple port of that arcade title they decided to push the NES to its limits but at the same time create a game that works around the NES capabilities. Firstly, obviously, the screen aspect ratio is changed, and the stages are longer. It still has the hard as balls, one hit in your dead style of gameplay, and there is quite a bit of noticeable flickering, but blend together the minimal story, the still perfect gameplay with the spread gun of course, the excellent music, the two player simultaneous co-op gameplay, the way each level feels and looks unique, and the smooth scrolling stages, what you've got is technically a poor by definition but when put next to the arcade it's fair to say that this game has a whole lot more going on. Konami really did put their all into this version and it paid off nicely, again getting itself ported constantly to this very day and gaining its rightful legacy as one of the very best 8-bit games of all time. Well, besides the Famicom release that is, as that version includes the Konami produced multi-memory controller built-in, which essentially blows a little bit more noz up your 8-bits ass to give you a couple of extra effects and a sexy little intro sequence to boot. And finally, here in the UK it was changed once again to Probotector, around two years later. I mean it's technically Contra still, through and through, but heavily sprite swapped with robots taking the place of certain humans in the game. So so that the game could pass Germany's censorship laws, which prohibited most violent games from being sold to minors. In retrospect, this is quite a cool thing from a collector's point of view, and at the time, pretty much everybody rich enough to own an NES and a copy of Probotector didn't know any different. But still, there's no denying that the PAL territories, for the time, got a little shafted in this area. So there you have it, the one that started it all. However, there is still so much more to cover as we move into the next title in the series, Super Contra in the Arcades. In my opinion, this version isn't exactly leaps and bounds above the original arcade release. However, it is still an incredibly rewarding and challenging game, perhaps even more so than before. 
It was released in the arcades during all of the hype of the original NES release in 1988, which definitely helped it. And the only real difference between the regions, besides the text, was that the Japanese release loops after completion, whereas the English language versions all end after the final boss. It's a good game, as you would expect, and the constant push of craziness with the enemies and its even more alien-like feel makes this one a bit more exciting than the original in my opinion. However, just like the original, it too is mostly known for its 8-bit Nintendo port where it was more widely known as Super C or Probotector 2 Return of the Evil Forces here in Europe. But firstly, here's the DOS port, which looks bad, feels bad and is way too fast. And yet again, the Amiga port is slower, but essentially the same again and it's incredibly hard to control. And honestly, enjoy. Anyway. Onto the NES ports. Greetings, it is I, Red Falcon, the vile alien warlord from Konami Super C for Nintendo. He never made it past my intergalactic goon squad and diabolic arsenal of destruction. This one never had a chance against my vicious genetic space freaks. And they were no match for my invincible 8th level invasion. See how far you can get in Super C. You never know where you might end up. <laughs> Unlike the last game, no differences other than the language can be found between the North American and Japanese releases, but just like last time, the European release is also a sprite swap with a different name and plenty of robots. So what makes this different than the original? Honestly, not a hell of a lot. It's still very much contra in the way it feels and looks, and for the time, a lot of reviewers complained about this. It's not quite the jump between, say, Streets of Rage 1 and Streets of Rage 2, but for fans of the original, of which there were plenty, the subtle changes do in fact change up the gameplay quite nicely and enough. You got different guns and returning guns have been refined, meaning that weapons like the spread gun are a lot more useless this time round. On top of this, the biggest jump is obviously the over the shoulder run forward sections, which have now been replaced by top down shooting run and gun sections, which I think feel far more interesting than they ever did before, and it helps keep up the frantic nature that a game like this offers. On top of that, just like the arcade, the levels feature a far more alien feel about them, especially in the second half of the game, and all in all, I think it's pretty much a perfect game. Konami definitely used the same engine for making this, but they learned from their very few mistakes, and most people didn't even realise that there were any to begin with. It's surprising to me that more people do not talk about this game over the original because it is essentially better in every possible way, just not by a large margin. Still, it's an absolute must of a game to try if this genre is for you. And you know what else is an awesome game that you must play in the series? Contra Free. No, not this Contra Free, the real Contra Free, aka Operation C. This is one of the reasons I just love making videos like this guys. I had no idea how good this game was, thinking it was just the watered down version of Contra or even Super C and technically, I, you know, I suppose it is, but what surprised me is just how good this title is and how amazing it feels. Sure it's a tad slower and most definitely a fair bit shorter than the original, however this is still Contra through and through, and feels great to play. Getting to play such a hugely successful game on a handheld system that looks and plays almost as good as the home experience must have been great for fans of the originals at the time, and now getting to play this title on the Switch via the Contra Anniversary Collection makes for a title that truly is the underdog of the series. Plus, on top of that, it introduced several elements such as the running across the screens at the beginning, the all-important homing shot and the chance to upgrade your spread weapon, which fans of the series will tell you all became mainstays for the series. In my opinion, this is the perfect transition between the classic 8-bit Contras found on the NES and the very, very best versions of the games found on the 16-bits. And guys, it's finally time to talk about those excellent titles. Yeah, sure, we still got one NES game to talk about, but enough is enough. Let's look at what most people believe is the very best game in the series. By this point, for the majority of my listeners, as in those from America, Contra had pretty much become a household name. 
If you had a console in the 80s, it's likely that you either had or had access to a Contra game of some sorts. Things such as getting an extra 30 lives with the infamous Konami code became common knowledge, and although it actually wasn't this series that kicked that off, it did get associated with the Contra name. But besides adding a little bit of extra flair to an already popular formula, which they kind of already did, there wasn't much more that this poor little extractor fan looking console could handle. And with the release of the Super Nintendo, it was an obvious choice for the company to start working on a new game for that system and who better for the job than a guy who had never worked on a game in the series before and had never even made a game for the new Parma Violent platform before either. Nobuya Nakazato, a guy that worked on quality control for the adventures of Bio Billy and had a special thanks mention in his role in Twin B3. Yeah, okay, I'm purposely running the guy short of some pretty hardcore achievements. But still, a strange move nonetheless. However, what Nakazato's son lacked in experience, he sure as hell made up for in passion. The guy knew the importance of Contra, and sure he did not develop it, but the understanding of the limitations that were put in place when making those older games were apparent to him from the get-go. Being able to bring all of this action, suspense, and simply brilliant gameplay to a new system was something he and his team were excited to get stuck into, and they did so without any any hesitation. The NES could only display four palettes of four colors simultaneously, so if a game used two palettes for player characters, like Contra did, that only left you two palettes for the background and all enemies. The SNES, on the other hand, allowed for 16 palettes of 16 colors. This meant we could do a lot more visually. We were able to incorporate unique color combinations that accentuated the distinct look of the game's variety of enemies. <laughs> Another improvement for the new system was the increase in sprites. Back in the 8-bit days, if a game had too many sprites, developers had to get around this by adding a sort of flicker effect to the characters. But with the Super Nintendo's ability to be able to double the amount of sprites on the screen, this very quickly became a luxury to develop for. And furthermore, the Super Nintendo did in fact have one more trick up its sleeve, and that is of course, Mode 7. I ran various tests for Mode 7 content in the run-up to planning the project. As I looked over the results, I came up with ideas for how to apply them. Konami had also started releasing arcade games such as Ajax with rotation features, so I looked at those as well. However, it was actually another Konami game that caught the interest of Nakazato-san, and that game was none other than... Checkered Flag. This was a top-down racing game that gave the effect of a single image with you racing on top of it. Add this with Contra's long life of expected gameplay change-ups, Nakazato-san decided to use this effect with Mode 7 for his extra levels in this new Contra game. This effect was used to even greater effect when going up against bosses in these levels, something that was just simply never done before on the system, and something that quite literally is impossible. This is Mode 7, guys, times 2. Or was it? The SNES had no sprite rotation feature, so we created animation patterns for 32 degrees of rotation. And by synchronizing these to the player's input, we created the illusion of two layers of rotation. Konami. The end result is a game that quite literally is perfect. It took everything that made those original games great, 
and in my opinion, it made them even better. Sure, a lot of people would prefer the perfect pixel precision of the original games, but for me, this was the title to beat. The scores came in incredible all over the globe, including Japan, where it was known as Contra Spirits, and of course in the UK, where it was still holding on to that Provotector name, with Super Provotector Alien Rebels. And yes, yet again, the game now has robots instead of Hollywood ripoffs. Even though I wasn't aware of the game when it was released back in the day, there is no denying that if I saw this, well I would have had to make some pretty lame excuses as to why my system would have been better over it. Remember, Gunstar Heroes didn't even make it onto the Mega Drive slash Genesis for another year and a half. In fact, Sega's contender to the 16-bit era didn't actually have any Konami games in its early days, not by early 1992 standards at least, and this was due to Nintendo's strict contract exclusivity. They wanted to develop for the competition due to it starting to make some serious waves around the world, and they finally did towards the end of the year with Sunset Riders, another game I desperately need to make a complete history on one day. Plenty more insanely good titles came and went, such as the Hyperstone Heist, Zombies Ate My Neighbors, Castlevania Bloodlines, and of course, oh my god, Hyper Dunk the Playoff Edition. As good as all these titles were, there was just no Contra slash Probotector 16-bit goodness in sight for Sega's little 16-bit wonder. And that was because Nakazado-san had decided not to make one. Instead, he'd already started working on the exceptional Rocket Knight Adventures, which again, seriously needs the complete history treatment. Anyway, Contra for Sega may not have happened straight away, but by the time that Nakazedo-san had finally got round to working on it, he and his team did so with the absolute best knowledge behind them. Nintendo may have had Mode 7, but Sega... Sega had blast processing, or just sprite processing if you prefer, and just like last time, Nakazato-san and his team, not wanting to create a game that looked worse or on par with their previous effort, decided to learn more about this marketing buzzword and see how they could implement it into this game. Compared to the SNES, the Mega Drive had tighter graphical restrictions, such as the number of colors you could use simultaneously. On the other hand, it excelled at processing sprites quickly. The end result is, in my opinion, something far more reminiscent of the classic 8-bit titles. Sure, I still prefer the jump that is Contra 3 on the SNES, but this Contra Hardcore title for the Genesis feels so incredibly impressive. Yet again, it got translated to Probotector over here on the Mega Drive with robots instead of people. Regardless, whatever version you decide to play, so many little tricks get implemented into this game that sure are a little gimmicky from time to time, but it makes it what it is. The game never gets boring, you're constantly coming up against the boss that you simply would never have seen in another title on the Mega Drive, or seeing an effect or gameplay style that's unfamiliar for the system. In my opinion, Contra Hardcore is kind of an important game to get for the Mega Drive. It's a game that most people overlook when compared to the way more popular and to be fair better Super Nintendo title, but still, it is stunning. Contra 3 was developed with the idea that it would have enough content to hold up to multiple playthroughs. With Hardcorps, I basically kept this principle by adding even more content into the game. That said, I figured that if it took too long to complete the game, players might not want to do so repeatedly, so I kept the length of the game the same but made it broader. Die Zukunft hat begonnen. Probotector bringt Farbe in deinen Gameboy. Probotector, der Actionknaller im Super NES. Tonnenweise Special Effects im Sega Mega Drive. Riesige Sprites. Probotector, himmlisch gut und höllisch schwer unterhalt die Fachpresse. Wert um 90% Spielspaß. Das ist spitze. Probotector, Action und Spannung. Fair in jedem Level. Weg die Power in dir. Probotector, der superstarke Videospielspaß. So 
some of you more hardcore Contra fans may have noticed that we've actually indeed got a little bit ahead of ourselves once again for this complete history. Because before Contra Hardcore, or Contra The Hardcore as it was known in Japan, which by the way got a very limited release compared to previous titles, making it an extremely sought after collectible, because one final game was released for the NES the same year that Contra 3 was released. This is Contra Force, a game only released in the States and a game that is not a Contra game. And I don't just mean that by the obviously very average gameplay. This game quite literally was not going to be a Contra game, but instead it was actually a game called Ark Hound that was pretty far in development. So much so that it actually got plenty of advertisements shown in magazines before its planned release was eventually canned for an unknown reason. Which was when Konami renamed it, slapped a Contra 3 logo on the front and called it a day. However, because of yet another delay, this Contra 3 for the NES ended up coming out after what was originally going to be Contra 4 for the Super Nintendo, resulting in the Alien Wars name being changed to Contra 3 Alien Wars and this one just being called Contra Force. <sighs> anyway, upon its release, it got plenty of average reviews and I think that's fair. I mean, it's not a bad game, guys. Well, compared to Contra it is, I suppose. But as its own title, it's perfectly fine. In my opinion, it's just a shame that it's called Contra because it actually doesn't have much of any kind of a tie-in to the previous titles. Try it out if you're curious, but honestly, don't waste too much time on it. Anyway, let's leave 1992 behind and jump ahead past that Mega Drive release and have a look at the PlayStation 1 game Contra Legacy of War. Originally shown off and announced at E3 1996, this title that featured genuine 3D was met with harsh criticism. Straight off the bat after Konami decided to hand out 3D glasses so that the press could... <coughs> enjoy the game in all of its 3D glory, when in actual fact it was seen as nothing more than a gimmick, which obviously the vast majority of reporters mentioned in their previews. These sort of problems would constantly rear their ugly heads during the development of this game by Appalooza Interactive, the same studio that worked on the classic Echo the Dolphin titles, in case you didn't know. As the project reached its end, it was held back as early previews had your character fighting side levels that were way too bright and colourful, with bosses that were far too easy and non-menacing. This did push the game back somewhat whilst corrections were made, but sadly, it didn't really do much of anything to save the game. The game was simply as bog standard as they come. It's still kind of played like Contra, becoming a bit of a mix of the standard game and the bonus levels from Contra 3, but all in all, it's a really rubbish attempt, and honestly, if it didn't have the Contra name attached, it would be completely forgotten about. And the same could be said for the next game in the series, see the Contra Adventure. Appalooza had another stab at the franchise and this time decided to make it even more like the originals by creating a 2.5D title, which is actually a good idea. It's um better, but not by much, as was the standard at the time. The game went down the gritty make everything grey and brown route and the results are quite forgettable. Firstly, the biggest red flag, if you will, is the fact that this game has become single player only. Looking at the gameplay, it's pretty confusing as to why they did this. There really is no reason besides the fact that you're probably not going to be finding any friends that want to play it with you. And then you get past level one. You see, that first level, you know, you got to give them their due. They kept it 2D, or 2.5D, should I say, platforming run-and-gun fun that is at least trying to stay true to form. But that is just the first level. You see, the biggest problem with the game is variety. Sure, all of the previous 2D titles had change-ups in the gameplay, but here, the bulk of the game is this new third-person, almost top-down style that the game forces upon you before you get to the last stage and you're presented with that 25 D gaming again. It's a sad, forgettable game that could have got at least a couple more review points if they kept it as a 2.5D styled game, but sadly, they didn't. Once these titles had shown what sadly Contra was going to look like on the 32 bits, nothing happened for a good four years, besides a compilation title on the classic 8 bit titles for the PC and a sort of remix title of Contra 3 for the Game Boy Advance. Now, 
This isn't the first time Contra 3 made its way onto handhelds, as seen with the 1994 release of Contra 3 for the Game Boy. Obviously Pro Protector 2 for us European gamers, just to keep it awkward. That version, although feeling fairly different for hardcore players and even missing the odd levels, is actually a really impressive port of a game which was on more powerful hardware. The Game Boy Advance port, however, that came in 8 years later, is a bit of a mixed bag. It looks and feels like Contra 3, but it's not quite there. Now, just to be clear, I didn't actually have Contra 3 when I was a kid, I only got it when I became a collector and therefore I don't have the hardcore connection that the majority of the fans that have made it this far into the video will have, so for me, the Game Boy Advance port is actually pretty solid, even if the game is zoomed in, certain enemy placements and projectile shootings are coming at you from a very slightly different location, the music obviously isn't as good and the Mode 7 sections are gone completely. The end result is a little bit all over the place, but for me, it's a pretty good experience. Those Mode 7 levels are replaced with levels from the Genesis versions of the game, which can be tricky when played on the GBA, but it's far from unplayable. In this day and age, it's pretty easy to get games like the original Contra 3 on the go, and I would definitely choose those versions over this one, but still, again, you ask me, you're not going to be going too far wrong with this sort of remixed title. Anyway, as we move away from the handhelds for half a decade before getting to the real juicy stuff on the Nintendo DS, we do actually have three games in the Contra series that were made for the PlayStation 2. Contra Shattered Soldier, Neo Contra and yet another re-release. So Contra Shattered Soldier. After a painful experience on the PlayStation 1 and Sega Saturn Konami decided that enough was enough and fair play to them. They got the main man from the 16-bit days Nabuya Nakazato back again and brought the Contra game home, deciding to develop it in-house and the end result this time is, well, actually it's pretty good. But again, it's not really Contra. Need more firepower? Jump into Contra, Shattered Soldier. Blazing fast action, swarms of alien enemies, and all the firepower you need to get the job done. Contra, Shattered Soldier, rated T for T for PlayStation 2 and Game Boy Advance from Konami. Ah! So, Shattered Soldier, besides still being very dark and gloomy for the most part, is what those 2.5D levels on the PlayStation 1 wish they could have been. It feels great, it looks well like a PlayStation 2 Contra game would look like, the sound and music is excellent and the gameplay changes up quite nicely whilst keeping true to that 2.5D viewpoint for the most part. The big difference, however, is the fact that this game is actually more like a uh, alien soldier for the Mega Drive. You run and gun for an extremely short amount of time and have fun doing so before you come up to a boss, you no doubt die, you try again, you eventually beat him and then you come up to another boss. And that's the entire game, learning how to beat boss after boss after boss whilst the game completely teases you in between with sections that capture the classic Contra pretty well, it's just a shame that those run and gun sections are not enough. Sure I would like some more run and gun but you know I can't deny that the bosses are still great fun. Learning what needs to be done with each encounter which by the way as you continue on is increasingly more different and bizarre than the last is quite the personal achievement when you suss it out. And best of all you get ranked after each one meaning that if you liked I don't know maybe Cuphead then you would be surprised to hear that Shattered Soldier is kinda like that. Obviously not as good as their deal with the devil, but it is still pretty good and if you don't mind putting in the time and can turn off what you expect the game to be, then you're going to have an addictive time with Contra Shattered Soldier. And on top of that, another game that I had a lot of fun with was Neo Contra. Again, this was an in-house developed game, but if you think Shattered Soldier was a departure from what you wanted, then this is even more of a departure. Still, it's a solid effort. 
what you have here is now a top-down style game similar in essence to the mode 7 sections from the super nintendo title but obviously now it's a lot more frantic and chucks a whole lot more at you as this is the whole game besides the occasional camera switch that happens very infrequently throughout the release there really isn't much here that you haven't seen before. You get ranked after each level, which again you need to score highly on if you want to unlock the second half of the game. You get big guns, bigger enemies, you need to be on your toes and then some. And if you play the way it's meant to be played, in multiplayer, then you're going to have an excellent time with this title. As stated after this on the PlayStation 2, we did get one more re-release as part of the Oritachi Game Center series, only in Japan of course, which is the original arcade release that came with all kinds of goodies. It is also worth noting that an N64 game was also in the works before those PlayStation 2 titles called Contra Spirit 64, but due to dwindling sales of the console in Japan, they decided to shelve the idea entirely and just never take it off the shelf. And on top of that, yet another game was cancelled very, very early on called Contra Online. And this really didn't get any further than simple ideas and one piece of imagery. The project was cancelled when Konami America and Konami of Japan just couldn't come up with an agreed approach to take. But guys, after all of those bad and above average games, there was one game that came out on the Nintendo DS that many fans think is one of the very, very best. Contra 4. Here we have the first true 2D Contra game. It was the series 20th anniversary and Konami decided that they wanted to go back to where it all began for the series, creating a true 2D game and they got none other than way forward technologies involved in doing just that. For Contra 4, we really wanted to take it back to old school. We'd gone to different places on the PlayStation 2, brought to 3D, we brought isometric views, but fans really loved the old school run and gun shooting action of the series. So we want to go sprite based. We want it to be simple controls that you remember from the old days. Running, jumping, ducking, dodging, shooting, power ups should all be the same. If you are playing Contra 3 on the virtual console recently, then you should feel right at home with Contra 4. And that's exactly what they did. Contra 4 is an incredible game. The whole dual screen aspect of the title makes it an absolute pleasure to try out. Sure, there are levels like the waterfall level that sometimes feels slightly too punishing due to the hidden area between the two screens, but having the ability to jump to and from the bottom and top screen has taken what was good about the formula and made it a far more tactile game. It will take some getting used to, but it's completely worth it. That is, if you can get it, as sadly this game did not make its way to PAL territories, and I have no idea why. For fans of this style of game, you're going to be hard pushed to find anything better besides WayForward's other releases, of course. The team really did study the series as best they could and it's what makes the game so incredibly special. In an interview with PoisonMushroom.org, Tom Hewlett, one of the associate producers, explains how important it was to take it back to the roots and explains how later titles failed to do so. In looking at the past games, the one thing we noticed was that they sort of turned into run and aim titles instead of run and gun. If you can simply hold down the button to fire an endless stream of bullets, it removes a lot of the tension from the game. Remember those tanks in the snow stage of Contra NES? You have to pound on that B button and just pray you can shoot fast enough to kill them. That is the exact feeling we wanted to bring back in our game. The main belief as to why it wasn't released here is because of the name Contra. A lot of people in Europe will know the name Probotector or even Grizor for the proper old school people out there. And even though this is not confirmed, it is believed to be the main reason as to why this game just didn't make it outside of America and Japan. Thankfully, however, 
The DS and DS Lite are both region free, so you shouldn't have too many issues being able to pick this one up for around about 30 to 40 quid, which is totally worth it. The same, however, cannot be said for its mobile port called Contra 4 Redux. This title is horrendous. Granted, I haven't actually given it too much time, but it's obvious that this was very much a rush job by Konami to cash in on the success of the DS game. And after looking it up, that's exactly what it was. The communication between the mobile team and Konami of Japan was non-existent at best, and the poor devs in that mobile team had to basically make up what was needed in an extremely short amount of time. Avoid this port like the plague. Next on the list came Contra Rebirth for the Wii as a download only title as part of the WiiWare service. Yet again this is more Contra and thankfully they stay true to the classics yet again with this title. It's not exactly chock a block full of extras as you may hope but the gameplay is solid, it plays exactly how you want it and even though it is a tad unfair in a few places it's still Contra at its core. This time the job was given to the legendary M2 who not only created Contra Rebirth but also Castlevania and Gradius 2 in this little mini remake set of releases. All in all the port house did a great job taking what was great about those original titles in the beginning and bringing it to a newer audience. The studio is known for their sheer quality to detail and this is no exception. Sadly it's not exactly easily accessible nowadays unless you, you know, hack a Wii console and perhaps, you know, maybe you should. Because this game is often overlooked when people talk about games that are no longer available. But with Stealth's recent rumour tweet saying that the entire trilogy of Rebirth titles plus a fourth Konami game may be on the way, hopefully this will eventually become a reality. If you know somebody that has this on the Wii, be sure to boot it up. In multiplayer too, of course. If you lived in Japan, there was actually an exclusive Contra game that got released uh, for mobile phones called Contra Star Wars and eventually Contra War of the Worlds. But it had nothing to do with those franchises. It was simply a Contra game for Java mobile phones that honestly plays perfectly fine. It definitely looks the part, it obviously isn't as gripping as anything you could do on a proper controller, but still for what it is, you know, it's perfectly fine. Anyway, this finally brings us to our two final games. Firstly, you have Hardcore Uprising, which although technically doesn't have Contra in the title, is still a standard Contra game. Kind of. And it was Arc Systems Works who were the guys behind this one. The teaming up of Konami and Arc Systems came together due to the excellent work done by Arc on such titles as Guilty Gear and Blaze Blue. It was obvious that the studio were able to make some pretty lavish 2D styled games and as the team were looking to make a Contra styled game themselves, they decided to replicate the slightly different style of Contra Hardcore for the Mega Drive, the awesome black sheep of the series and essentially make a spin off to that. Internally, we thought we should make a Contra-ish game, a run-and-gun shooter. At first, we started talking about something different, just looking forward to a business opportunity. Then, someone came up with an idea to utilize Arc System Works' strong points, great art style and great animation with a side-scrolling shooter. Of course, we know they can make very good 2D games, like Guilty Gear and Blaze Blue. Then, we started to move forward with this game. The game is really inspired by Contra Hardcore. Many Contra fans realize Contra Hardcore is a little bit far from the regular Contra franchise. Since we're going to link it to Contra Hardcore, we could make this into a brand new franchise. The game feels like Contra, it plays like Contra, but for hardcore gamers you will notice a slight difference to what you would normally expect. It's a lot more forgiving than the classic games and the tone just feels very different, which is technically what they're going for I suppose. It has a fantastic rising system which I prefer to play as as it lets you unlock upgrades for your character as you work your way through the game as you get better at it. The gameplay gets mixed up fairly often in this title from classic Contra styled games to levels on vehicles which definitely make up some of the more intense sections of the title. And now for the first time even Mark of the Ninja like styled stealth sections too. Which may sound bad on paper for a Contra styled game but seriously. This many games in, it's a welcome change. 
Again, this is an often overlooked game from the series, mostly because it's not a game in the series, I suppose. And instead, Konami's attempt at making something completely brand new here. But don't be fooled, if you like run and guns, this is without a doubt worth your time. Which sadly cannot be said for Contra's final entry on this list. This is Contra Road Corps. It was a long time coming and a whole eight years since the last game to be exact, which again was technically a spin-off, so you know, feel free to add an extra year for those previously mentioned arcade and mobile games, which again are HD remakes, to take it back even further yet again for the last true Contra entry, making this a whole 10 year gap between proper Contra releases. Well, actually, I suppose that now's a good time to very quickly gloss over Contra Return, a free-to-play mobile game which plays more like an RPG with special ways to get you to pay for your upgrades. I mean, it's Contra on mobile, so it doesn't feel good. It's not horrific, but it's far from anything that I would ever play, even if it does have the Terminator in it and a pretty impressive-looking Japanese advert. Anyway, back to that final Contra game. Why the wait? Well, it turns out that nakazato san did actually want to make a new game in the series, but the powers that be simply didn't think that the fans were still here. The big change, however, came in after the NES Classic and the SNES Classic, and I suppose eventually the Mega Drive Mini. When all of these systems came out, Konami realized that yes, people do still indeed enjoy Contra, and maybe they want more Contra. But sadly, the people just didn't get it. The game took one year for pre-production and another two years for development using an in-house Konami engine and Nakazato-san attempted once again to make it 3D by flipping the angle from a 2.5D to a somewhat isometric style instead. The end result is, is pretty mediocre. This is a gameplay style that has been done endless amounts of times to great effect, but this new Contra title, it just feels dated from the get-go. Kinda like it was a sort of HD port of a PlayStation 2 game or something. The top-down PvP gameplay simply just did not lend itself well to this style of game, and reviews reflected that. Take away the Contra name and it would still be a well below average game. And of course by adding it, all they have really done is given the franchise, yet again, a bad name. This game is about playing together, having fun together. It's not too much about having to plan out your schedule to play this game. It's not a game that you need two or three hours in a row to enjoy. We hope that with this game players will be able to reconnect with old friends and family that they may have played Contra games with before. We want people to be able to come together through Contra Road Corps. Obviously it didn't. However, if there was a game that was going to bring all of those old school Contra fans back together, then it would be Contra Anniversary Collection. Although it's far away from being any kind of complete collection, missing several incredible hidden gems like the DS entry, the WiiWare title, or even the PlayStation 2 titles from the series, however, it does at least do one thing. It shows why Contra is so well loved and for that alone, it's definitely worth the asking price. The characters from Contra showed up plenty more times than I could possibly mention, and I'm not just talking about pachinko machines either, you got wrestling games, Nano Breaker on the PlayStation 2, Rocket Knight, Windows 95, Wallpaper Packs in Japan, Bomberman R, Snatcher, Mobile Puzzle Games, and of course, Baseball Games too, because you know, that all makes sense. 
there's just no way we are getting away from Contra. And although sometimes we wish we could, after looking at the complete history, I do think it's fair to say that there are more good games in the series than bad ones. And hey, if you ask me, I'm pretty sure we will still get plenty more 2D throwbacks to the titles that we like the most in the series. I love the old 2D games, and I love to make new ones, but just modernizing the graphics, updating the graphics, and creating something new in them would not be the right way to do it, in my opinion. I'd have to come up with a new innovation and maybe change a bit of the genre, and then I could start working on one of those. Yeah, but come on, nobody wants to play as a bloody panda anymore, right mate? Hey there guys, thank you all for checking out Contra The Complete History. I bet you've already run down there to type something that I've missed, but I think it's a pretty comprehensive complete history uh, that I've done here. Um, thank you all so much. If you've really made it this far, go down to the comments and give yourself a high five. I'll make sure to give one back to you as well. Um, yeah, like this video has taken such an incredibly long time to make and whenever I make a video like this I'm just so so proud at the end that I know I've made something that will hopefully outlive me if YouTube outlives me you know <laughs> something that I'm really really proud of and I hope you guys liked it um, like I said this particular video this entire channel uh, but especially videos like this uh, wouldn't be possible if it wasn't for people like um, my patreons and my YouTube members uh, these are the guys that help me uh, uh, take a little bit of relief off the fact that you know not having to put out daily content I can make videos like this that do take longer um, and it's because of those particular people that I'm able to do it so if you want to become a YouTube member or a Patreon, click those links down below. Uh, you'll also see exclusive Kick Scammer content every single month, um, loads of other perks, exclusive Discord rooms, and loads of other stuff, nerdy discussions that we record for my second channel. All of that, all of that. Um, but yes, uh, what I want to do right now is give a massive shout out to those patrons and YouTube members that help me out every single month, like I keep saying, uh, with an extra big shout out going to Gary Pinkett, Ryan Burford, Andrew Dalton, Ben Jackson, Jonathan Hayward, Kevin King, Christopher Turnbull, Pretty With Horns, Jeff Mianowski, Elf Daughter Crafts, Richard Aldegic, Shadow Dial, Roven Army, Ryan Holtz, Retro to Next Gen, Dina Robertson Dunn, Adam Lefty Taylor, Intrigued Gaming, Tim Labonte, Asobi Quang DX, Tim Lunn, Conrad Constantine, Pretendo64, Creamy Elephant, Blitz Hedgy, King Link Reviews, Jeff Ladd, uh, Mike Martin, RetroReversing.com, Angus McChilly, RL Sloan Friendly, Shadow Dragon, Game Apologist, Chris Applin, Wobbles and Bean, The Wonder Ducks, Ye Old Hamburglar, Dampity, Lucas Oftel, Ronnie Method SSWV, Solix Captor, Jeremy Rodriguez, Nick Pollard, Bram Perez, Marcus King and Cut Tyndall, Richard Carter, aka Fantastic Dizzy, Todd Paul Float G, Petty Mew, uh, Thomas Rosendale, Dina81, Trans Rights, and Samuel Nielsen. All of you guys are absolutely legendary, as is every single one of my Patreons and YouTube members. If you guys want to become a part of this incredible list right here, like I say, the links are down below. You're helping support the channel. You get to help me make more videos like these. You get to see what I'm working on and 500,000 other perks that I'm sure you will discover when you click those links below. Anyway, I think that's enough plugging for now, isn't it? Yes, this is DJ Slope signing out, and hopefully I'll see you all next time.